Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 113 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. As you know, I and the rest of the Modern Bar Cart team really like to dig into a great cocktail book every now and then, and it's always a real treat to be able to pull up a seat and discuss the project with the author. This time around, the book in question is called Spirits, Sugar, Water, Bitters, How the Cocktail Conquered the World. It was co-authored by two Washington, D.C. authors, Derek Brown and Bob Ewell, And this interview was, in fact, recorded in the legendary Columbia Room, Derek's bar of almost 10 years, which was named Best American Cocktail Bar in 2017 at the Spirited Awards. That's just one of many awards that Derek and his establishments have amassed over the past decade. His Wikipedia entry lists dozens of them from reputable publications and organizations across the country. And his influence on the D.C. cocktail scene runs deep as a founding member of the D.C. Craft Bartenders Guild. We'll hear the story of how Derek and his co-author, Bob Ewell, teamed up to create this excellent book, but as always, before we jump into the interview, let's give you the chance to make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the Slow Screw. Yeah, that's a drink. And the reason we're featuring it is because I was really delighted by the Cocktail Dark Ages chapter in Bob and Derek's book. The Slow Screw is yet another take on the classic screwdriver cocktail that emerged in the 1970s, and it has some interesting variations that we'll get into in a minute here. To make this seductive cocktail, you'll need one ounce of vodka, always a promising start, one ounce of slow gin, which is a fortified infused gin from England, actually a very classic ingredient, a little bit on the sweeter side, and finally three ounces of orange juice. Combine these ingredients in a cocktail shaker with ice, shake until cold, and then strain over fresh ice in a highball glass and garnish with an orange slice. In our Book of Honor, Derek Brown leaves no uncertainty as to his stance on orange juice drinks. He's not a fan. Regarding the slow screw, he states, quote, Here's that OJ and booze category once again, and no, I have not changed my mind. Do not make this drink unless you truly want to channel the era, and you have to find another use for your bottle of slow gin. The slow screw spawned a whole category of drinks using similar puns. The slow screw against the wall with Galliano, also used in the Harvey wall banger. Slow screw on the beach based on sex on the beach with peach schnapps. And a slow, comfortable screw up against the wall. Throw in some southern comfort. The whole thing is despicable, yet I do find it kind of entertaining, so there is that. End quote. Now, before you get the idea that this whole book is just full of weird cocktails that Derek and Bob don't like, it's it's not. It's actually got a ton of great history, lots of awesome recipes, which we discuss in detail during this interview. Some of the other topics we cover include how Bob and Derek fuse their expertise on opposing sides of the bar to create this book as a tribute to a 10-part cocktail seminar series at the National Archives, why and how we experience historical echoes in the cocktail world, and how these echoes can help connect us, at least in spirit, with our tipsy ancestors. The importance of names and definitions in the cocktail world, both for the original cocktail and all the variants that spun off through the years. Then we get a little funky. We talk about what grows on the graves of dead Virginians, who's about to take a hatchet to Derek's bar, and the merits of a TGI Friday's Caesar salad. During this interview, we laugh and we cry. We daydream about what Edgar Allan Poe liked to drink before he died in a puddle. And then we share our most embarrassing book errors and widely published typos. In short, it was a dream interview. I enjoyed it to my core, and I know you will too, so without further fanfare, prepare yourself to get fairly fuzzled 
partially pungy, and just a teensy bit nymptopsical with Derek Brown and Bob Yule, authors of Spirits, Sugar, Water, Bitters, How the Cocktail Conquered the World. Derek and Bob, thanks for being on the podcast. Our, our pleasure to be here. Thanks yeah. for having us. So can you each introduce yourself to our listeners and just give us a, a brief bio of who Derek and Bob are? Sure. You want to go first, Bob? Sure. So um, I am uh, came from a background in journalism. I worked for a Japanese newspaper for quite a while, the Saudi Shimbun, covering U.S. politics from a Japanese perspective here in D.C. So sort of odd beginnings, but went into uh, nonprofit communications, sort of global health. Then found my way to a production company, so work for uh, Long Story Short Media. Also been a tour guide in D.C. for about the past 20 years, so uh, that's one of my sort of odd side jobs. Yeah, uh, Garrett Peck, who's also yes. been on the podcast, is also a tour guide. Also He's fantastic. Author. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. At one point, I had the record of going on the most Garrett Peck tours. I've been on seven. So. <laughs> nice. That's fantastic. Uh, Derek, go ahead. Yeah, I'm Derek Brown, and I am the owner of this bar that we're in, the Columbia Room. I write on cocktails and spirits. Um, I guess I'm ostensibly a spirits and cocktails expert. And I uh, wrote this book with Bob called Spirits, Sugar, Water, Bitters, How the Cocktail Conquered the World. Yeah, and that's that's going to be the focus of our interview today. I'm sure that we're going to get into some other things. But before we dive into the book too far, I, I, I guess let's talk about how each of you found your way into the cocktail world, because I have a feeling that's somewhat different stories here. <laughs> Yeah, and actually that's one of the reasons why it was so fortuitous that we did this together, I think, because it is mostly from my perspective. But one of the great things about having Bob writing it with me is that I got to see some of the outside perspective as well. Somebody who doesn't isn't necessarily a bartender or working within the cocktail industry, somebody who had a little different take. And so, yeah, that's been great to help, I think convey the information that we had to in a fairly breezy format. Sure. Yeah. And it's tough in the cocktail history world, right? Because you're necessarily, you know, poking the Wondrich bear. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'd like to address this right off the bat. I'm not a historian. <laughs> and, and I was very clear in here. In fact, I always feel like in, like in one page, I'm just like, all this information could be wrong. I don't know. You'll find out later. So, uh, you know, I did my best and we did our best to make this information correct. Um, but yeah, I'm not a historian. So Yeah, but you're, you are a practitioner. So can you tell us how you uh, kind of worked your way up through various bar programs here in D.C.? Just give us the short version and then we sure. can, I guess, dive deeper as the chance arises. Yeah, I mean, I kind of started out as a shiftless loser. I had no idea what I was going to do. And I started working in restaurants and bars. In fact, I had been working in restaurants and bars since I was 16. But I, I started to take it seriously. And I became a bartender, and I really loved it. And then from there, I became a sommelier and started working in management. I remember very well the day that I moved from a bartender to a bar manager. And rest in peace, Mike Tilch, who was a great wine connoisseur in the area and ran a wine store told me he's like it's a real shame when a bartender becomes a manager <laughs> and <laughs> and i felt really bad about that um but i started doing wine and, and management and then decided to go back behind the bar and do more with that starting the program the gibson long long time ago and then opening the passenger and the columbia room and the columbia room now is wow it's been around since 2010. So technically, 2020 will be its 10 years of existence. Wow. One year we weren't open. We moved spaces from the old space to the new space. Right. But we've been around for 10 years. Still in the Shaw neighborhood as well. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Bob, how about you? How'd you get into the cocktail space? Yeah, so I can't, kind of came to it from the drinking perspective um, from the other side of the bar. But I basically learned how to drink in Derek's bars. Um, so the DB3, as they used to call them. Um, for Southern Efficiency, Mockingbird Hill, and Eat the Rich. Oh, that's two blocks from my house, and we'd go there all the time. And I, for me, I sort of came at from it from the history perspective as well, because I'm sort of a history geek. And for me, this was a whole a window into a historical kind of culinary world that I knew nothing about. And that was very rich and kind of woven into the culture of the country. And yet I was still drinking pretty poorly and uh, not taking advantage of all that. And so I like to think I learned how to drink better. And that was mm -hmm. <laughs> for the past 10 years or so. It kind of coincided with the, you know, the cocktail revival and uh, in DC. And so I was lucky to benefit from that and really learn a lot. And I think going to classes, Museum of American Cocktail, classes taught by Derek, by Phil Green, by others coming through DC, um, it was a great education into the cocktail world. 
Right. Let's fast forward to that, because in the book, you mention uh, that sort of 10 class series almost as being kind of a bit of a precursor to the book. And that's kind of where you two came together a little bit. So can we talk about that that series that you did? Yeah, there was in 2015 there at the National Archives, they had the Spirited Republic, which was an exhibit that showcased alcohol in American life from the founding of the Republic to the present day. And it was really a great exhibit, except they were missing one thing. They didn't have anything about cocktails in it. So they talked to me and asked me if I would like to be a part of it in some way, not in terms of necessarily creating the exhibit, but maybe creating some kind of addendum to it around cocktails. And, and, and I thought that was a great idea. So we created the history of the cocktail series that went along with it, where we had 30 different experts from like Dale Groff, Julie Reiner, David Wondrich, Charles Jolie, all kinds of people come in and talk about the history of cocktails. There were journalists, there were Robert Simonson from the New York Times, there were bartenders, there were distillers, there were historians, and we just, just got together and we talked about it. And it, and it was amazing. It was something around like the eighth or ninth seminar where somebody asked like, where do I get this information? <laughs> like, it's it's amazing. Where have you recorded it? And it was like, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um well, <laughs> fuck, you know, and so I think that was when I started the seed of we should, you know, write a book about it. And Bob was one of the few people. There was like mm -hmm. four, right? Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Yeah. But but uh, few people who attended all of them. And I don't really remember everything that was said, <laughs> frankly. And and um, so I couldn't tell. It wasn't a faithful retelling. You know? Do you know that song? Uh, this is the, the this, greatest tribute. Yes. Song to the yes. greatest song, or this is you know by um, who, who? What is it? Jack White or T Jack T yeah. Tenacious D? Tenacious D. <laughs> yeah. That's your that's your new nickname. Jack Black. Jack White. Jack Black. Yes. So this is the Tenacious D uh, version of cocktail <laughs> history, and so. You know, it, it. I think we remembered a lot of it. I think a lot of the information came out. And what was great is we saw a narrative we threw out it, and, and we were happy to present that. It's a little difficult. There were three cocktails served right before you could bring it in. You're actually <laughs> drinking in the archives. So I think that's why so some of why, some of our memories were a little bit dimmed because by the end of it, everybody was a little bit lit. But it was kind of amazing. You're actually drinking like near the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Right. And uh, if you like after they were held on like Sundays in the afternoon, if you'd go that evening to one of Derek's bars, you would see Dale DeGroff, Julie Reiner, like, you know, uh, Phil Green, all you Dave Wondrich, and if you if you just knew who they were, they would be sitting right next to you. It was kind of an amazing exactly. Thing. Yeah, that's that's that sounds like an amazing experience. One of the things that I like about the book, let me let me tell you what I really appreciate about the book, and then maybe we can get into some of the nuts and bolts of, of putting it together and some of the information. Now, of course, this is a history book, and so it's not like we can just walk through this because then people aren't going to go want to go out and buy it. Right. So I don't want to spoil the entire game, but I do want to tell people what I appreciate about this book relative to some of the other texts that are out there. Because to be honest, when I found out that it was a history book, I was like, oh, great, like another one of these. And <laughs> So as as I read through it, th there were some things that really jumped out at me. And you mentioned a moment ago that you uh, started seeing some patterns. Mm -hmm. and, and the way that I think about those is almost like echoes. And I was actually talking to some of your bartenders out there about the new menu here at the sure. Columbia Room, which is so bad, it's good. Yep. Some of these really bad cocktails from the 70s, 80s, early 90s. And, you know, what we were saying is like, well, it's, you know, we're we're coming back to that and trying to, you know, see what was good and, and what can we make better now. It's and, and there's so we're experiencing echoes in that way. And, you know, one echo was, you know, right in one of the early chapters, we talked about um, peach brandy and its importance in the colonies. And, you know, you said it's not like George Washington was was drinking sex on the beach. Right. <laughs> he was, you know, it was a very different thing. And and yet then in the you know second part of the 20th century, all of a sudden we have peach schnapps and it changes the game. But it's an echo. And so to me, uh, a lot of the value in reading this book was connecting those dots. And, and I think there's a, a lucidity to it and, and a self-consciousness to the book that's different than the Dave Wondrich self-conscious. Dave, Dave Wondrich likes to kind of poke fun and, and poke holes. And I think when when you do that in the book, when, when you're identifying trends that, that maybe were, you know, like, like the vodka martini, we spent mm -hmm. a lot of time and, and you're, you're very careful to let the air out of that one in very strategic ways, but, but it's still really valuable. So um, I guess to me, the one real big takeaway was the echoes and then being able to zoom out and really connect those dots, not just from like one part of the 20th century or pre-prohibition to now, but like stretching back to like 
before the colonies were even a thing. And I, I, I came out of the book, I think, a much better thinker in a, in a big picture sense as a result. Yeah, and an argument for why the history, uh, why this was needed is because we do have actually some great history of cocktails and some great writers. David Wondrich was one, Wayne Curtis is another. They're out, Robert Simonson's book on the contemporary cocktail movement, but none of them pull it together. There's mm -hmm. no textbook, if you will. You know, if you're going to teach a class on the history of the cocktail, and I actually just found out our book is going to be included in a hey. Yale, Yale course, hey. which is great. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, then this is the book. You know, I mean, obviously, I, I admit I'm not a strict historian, nor am I dispassionate in this, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you're talking about the vodka martini. I mean, right. I didn't make any bones about it. I don't like that drink in <laughs> comparison to the gin martini. But I also kind of make these concessions that, well, maybe, you know, maybe I was a bit of a jackass when I first started talking about it. But now I'm kind of cool about it. I only think it's like slightly a bad drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bob, what was what was your role in the construction of this book? Like, you know, we, we mentioned that you, know, you you were kind of the perspective from the other side of the bar. How did that play out when you were constructing the book? Well, you know, we, we kind of looked at the, these eras, too, and we, we divvied them up. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, you know, I've got a big interest in early American history. And so from the you know founding period to birth of the cocktail, I really kind of wanted to um, hit those time periods because time I've done a lot of research on as well. So bringing kind of that bit of historic perspective. But then also, I think, you know, trying to bring it a little bit to a more general audience as well. You know, for me, these are many of the things I remembered from the Museum of American Cocktail classes, from the archives class, that I think for a lot of folks that are in the industry or that, you know, do cocktail history, um, it's kind of old news. Like, it's, right. it's not even worth mentioning because everyone sort of knows it. But I, I think for the general audience of people that are just getting into cocktails, or even if they are, there's a lot of that that's still new to them. And it really helped me connect the dots. And so I think, you know, helping to lay that narrative out for that audience to connect the dots for them was something that I really, you know, was hoping to do. Um, and things that like you mentioned, peach brandy, for me, that was like a huge kind of revelation because I had no idea what peach brandy was. But I've done a lot of research on, you know, 19th century Virginia and uh, Thomas Jefferson, Edgar Allan Poe. And, um, you know, I would always be reading that Poe's favorite, what it was said to be one of his favorite drinks was peaches and honey. And so mm -hmm. I had really no idea what that was until at writing this book. I'm like, wait, that's peach brandy. It's a punch. You know, yeah. peach brandy is the key ingredient to that. Sure. And now to be able to actually drink it again, you know, several distilleries making it again. Again, like Tocton Creek, which is local, others around the country, it's you're tasting a bit of history there. Yeah, yeah, and it, and, and we talk about the different sort of like quintessential American spirits, right? Like bourbon has a uh, house resolution that it's an American heritage product. <laughs> product. I think people talk about rye whiskey, and then mm. and then certainly rum was, a bit of it, but I think peach brandy was probably the real. Yeah. Like American spirit. And so, yeah, it was, it was fun. And quite technically, we just divvied up the chapters and then we started intermingling mm -hmm. where they made sense. And it doesn't, you can't tell. It's not like, oh, this is a Derek chapter and this is a Bob chapter. It's very seamless. And, and so, okay. yeah, from, from we a... We melded our minds. <laughs> yeah. He stuck me with the 1970s, though. That was the uh, <laughs> it was the toughest. I think it's about it's the shortest chapter. Our editor was like, I think you guys need to expand this a little <laughs> bit more. I, um, but it had its own interest too. Actually, it's it was more interesting than I thought it would be. It was actually probably one of my favorite chapters. No way. So we'll we'll get back to that in a second. But I want to ask you quickly a question that Shakespeare once asked, which is, what's in a name? One of the things that we talk about in this book are the names that should be given to cocktails. So like in this instance, I'm thinking of the vodka martini again, right? Mm -hmm. The kangaroo cocktail. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, just the names that the cocktails kind of developed themselves. I guess, why is it important what we call cocktails? Right. Well, it was a drink. And I think that that is evidenced by the title of the book, that there is a original definition, 1806, spirit, sugar, water, bitters. That's what the cocktail was, at least as far as we know. If you look throughout the book, it starts with one drink and then all of a sudden it expands to more. And then there's a certain point where I'm quoting Henry William Thomas, who's a, a DC bartender, um, and how he just expands the definition to include sours and, and drinks that were not traditionally considered a cocktail. And then by the time you get to the 1970s, it's all gone. There's no specific language around what a cocktail is at mm -hmm. that point a cocktail you know could be you know you're like oh we're at a cocktail party oh i'm gonna have a glass of wine or beer i mean right. the, the word cocktail becomes diluted sure you know, no pun intended but but yeah it, it, 
ultimately we wanted to show this was an evolution and language is an evolution in it. And I'm not mad at that. I mean, language changes, um, but I do want to show people how it changed. And there's something very fun about it. It's very American language, you know, and it, it starts out very, you know, what's in a whiskey cocktail, you know, what's in, you know, a rum cocktail. Right. Uh, but it gets to a point sort of in the 1840s, 1850s, when, you know, you've got things like moral suasions, and they're being playful with the terms. And um, it, it becomes, there's a bit of fun injected in it. And I think we write early in the book, too, about Benjamin Franklin had his uh, drinker's dictionary in the 1730s. It's like over 200 terms for, you know, getting drunk. Yep. And it was, I think, like, nimtopsical. Right, right, right. Puzzled, Sir John cropped. Strawberry, <laughs> mm -hmm. Ben de Barbados, yeah. Yeah, too, too much rum, <laughs> um, and that was they think that that's one of the first kind of collections of American colloquialisms yeah. published, and that's about spirits and about cocktails. Sure, and even what we call bartenders, mixologists of tipulars, right? Yeah, yes, right? exactly. Yeah. Eighteen fifties. Well, there is a lot of creative language about it, and it went up all the way up to the slow, comfortable screw <laughs> on a beach. I mean, people got real creative. Yeah. <laughs> That, yeah, that's that. That's a uh, so I, I should mention at this point that the cool thing about this book is is not only is it a history of cocktails is that between each chapter you or I, I should say after the chapter proper where we learn about a particular era we have several cocktails from that era and then we also have an original cocktail designed by you kind of in the spirit of that era as well. So for folks who are thinking about purchasing this book, not only do you get to read about the cocktails, you get to you know, actually be instructed on them and you can try them in your own home with modern ingredients for the most part. Yeah. And um, uh, this is a thing most people don't know, but it has two bookmarks specifically. So you can bookmark the page where the story is and the page where the recipe is. Design minded. <laughs> That was one of my jobs, di division of labor. I had to test out the recipes for the layperson. So I, I'm a very bad bartender, and <laughs> it takes me forever. Uh, my husband's a little bit better, but we went through and we tried every single one of them to make sure people at home, you know, could could re replicate them. So beautiful. It was difficult work. <laughs> <laughs> we call it a R and D, you. research and drinking. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so. Again, don't want to give up the game, but I want to get a couple of hot takes on the book. And, and these are some stories that I thought were particularly amusing and that I had never really come across. So you ready for just a couple of hot takes? Yeah, let's go. Bring it on. All right. Number one, this is kind of in a quiz format, but you wrote the book, so you should be fine. <laughs> uh -oh. What grows on the grave of a true Virginian when he dies? As a true Virginian, born in Virginia, um, mint, of course. <laughs> and why is that? Uh, from the, mint, the profusion of mint juleps that they drink throughout their lives. That was a fun one. It was, uh, I think, for, uh, European travel log. Uh, and you kind of get the most information about how Amer Americans are drinking from Europeans mm -hmm. uh, because it is this uniquely American thing they're witnessing. And so they're witnessing that Virginians, you know, loved their juleps. And it was a medicinal drink taken by Virginians in the morning. First started out with rum, kind of evolved to brandy, eventually, you know, bourbon, mint and ice. But the mint was there early on. And it was sort of a signifier of a true Virginian uh, drinking it with mint. Right. And the proto cocktails are kind of like an almost an emblem of where our nation was at at that point in time. They, they, they weren't quite there at the spirit, sugar, water, bitters definition, but they were on their way there. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that was, uh, you know, why the Europeans had such a fascination with us. I mean, they poked at us kind of from afar right up through the Civil War. They had people who observed the Civil War as well. And I, I think, you know, considering that Jerry Thomas's bartender manual came out in the same year that the, the Civil mm -hmm. War occurred, I, I think we're on a really kind of auspicious timeline. Um, so number two, second hot take, what is a hatchetation? <laughs> do you need me to use that in a sentence? Yeah, yeah, well, let's get it in a sentence. I, I do know the answer, but I'm just curious to, <laughs> to see you use that in a sentence. I had to go check my parking meter, and while I was there, I went to my trunk to get my hatchetation tool before I came to the Columbia Room. <laughs> Well, you would be speaking of none other than Carrie Nation. Yeah. The, every nation is welcome here except Carrie Nation. She was a woman who was known for busting up bars with her hatchet. And yeah, she was pretty successful at it, actually, and, and became a bit of a celebrity in her own right by going around smashing up bars with a hatchet. Yeah, they used to just sort of sit in front of bars and pray and sort of try to uh, shame, you know, the drinkers inside from that. And she took it one step further, <laughs> actually. And um, yeah. yeah and, and she was part of the temperance movement, of course. Mm -hmm. And this is another kind of inauspicious uh, movement when it comes to spirits and cocktails for us. But then on the other side of that, 
you know, we have the the temperance movement, we have prohibition, mm -hmm. we have the death of so many cocktails, and you cover this all in great detail in your book. And then for our final hot take on on the other side of that, we have the shining mecca that is TGI Fridays. Oh yeah. And why is TGI Fridays so amazing in the cocktail store? Why do we owe them so much credit? Well, the thing is that cocktails died. We talk about prohibition being the thing that killed cocktails, but the thing that we experienced more than anything was the dark ages killing cocktails. And, and you know, it makes sense, right? Like you don't want to drink an old fashioned that your father drank, you know, and you want to take some drugs and it's the 1970s and it's different. Everything changes. And so I understand that. And TGI Friday, especially in, in Europe, brought back bartending as a skilled job, you know? And so bartenders were required to learn all of these different drinks. And yes, the mudslide was in there, which is kind of delicious, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Not a serious cocktail, but hard to say it doesn't taste good, right? So yeah, they, they kind of like brought it back in a way. So, so we owe them a debt of gratitude. How did the TGI Fridays that we're talking about now, how, how did that look different than it does today? <laughs> oh, the Fern Bar, yeah. The Fern Bar. Well, you know, some of the elements were still there, sort of the red and white uh -huh. awning, the ferns, the Tiffany, you know, chandeliers, but it was really, it was a singles joint. Mm -hmm. It was the, you know, Upper East Side um, of New York. And, you know, I think it was it brought sort of men and women drinking in the same space again in, in a, you know, kind of casual way. You know, I, I think it's a perfect story of, you know, from the 70s to then the commercialization of the 80s to the, you know, Tom Cruise cocktail. It sort of oh, follows yeah. that trend. But I think, you know, it was it was a fun place to drink and it was yeah. where people went to meet other people. Yeah, I had a, a mentor in wine who would tell me, don't forget that this that drinking should be fun. You <laughs> yeah. know, and so TGI Fridays embodied that. They, they yeah. had some skill behind it, but they also gave it fun. Sure. Now, obviously, it's sort of like a pale shade of what it was, um, but you can get a $3.99 Caesar salad there. <laughs> I got that and it wasn't that bad. I mean, it's not that good, but it wasn't bad. For $4, it was right what it should be. It was good. I mean, they're around for a reason. <laughs> so, those are some amazing hot takes. For folks listening, there's a ton more stuff just like this in the book. You're, every page, you're kind of turning up something new that somebody researched so that you didn't have to. And it's I, I, my book is is circled and scribbled all over with stars and, and underlines. So I do encourage you to, to pick up a copy of this. The one thing that I will say is that the last chapter of this book is dedicated to kind of the present or the kind of immediate past in cocktails, what we might call the cocktail renaissance. And you do a really good job. And I think it's a hard job because we are in an explosion right now. There's so many people who need credit, deserve credit for all the amazing things happening, including here in DC, mm -hmm. New York, all these other cities and around the world. Um, so I think you'd give a really good overview of who the, the, the biggest names are and, and who we can start looking into after this. Yeah. So we get a good picture of the present, but what I'm curious about is to see if you have any thoughts on the ghost of cocktail future. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, when I was thinking about how to phrase this question, I grew up uh, watching with my parents, Star Trek, The Next Generation. Oh, yeah. On the USS Enterprise, they have what's called 10 Forward. It's a bar where Guinan, uh, bartender, yeah. Yep, Whoopi Goldberg <laughs> is serving up um, what is largely synthahol, synthetic alcohol. And I'm often fascinated by the um, Star Trek Gene Roddenberry utopian interpretation mm -hmm. of the future. And it's interesting to me that alcohol is sort of kind of neutered would be one way to say it, kind right. of kind of taking the wind out of it. And so I'm wondering if you think we are heading toward a future where cocktails and alcohol are you know, moving in that direction or if there's maybe a different vision of the future, whether utopian or dystopian. God, I have so many things to say right now. I literally <laughs> just walk, went back and rewatched the entire Star Trek Next Generation. So um, I'm full of ideas about that. <laughs> First of all, it's a, like a military industrial complex that rules the entire world. There's nothing problematic about that to people. <laughs> the, you know, like, they come second of all, people are in these sexless uniforms that are like uh, supposed to be, you know, I don't know. They have Will Riker. He's kind of awkward, but he's still progressive. I mean, there's so many weird things about that show. Let's just put it there. <laughs> but John Luke still gets his vineyard. Right, exactly. True, and, true. and a new show coming out, soon, which I can't wait. It's true. <laughs> 
But um, Sinfa Hall is a, not a, something of the future. It's being created right now. Literally, they're mm -hmm. creating a product that you can drink and not get drunk on. So that'll be interesting to see when that comes up. And, and when they announced that it was being developed, they didn't even mention Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? That was such an oversight. Wow. And on Twitter, nobody exploded with like, hey, wait a minute. What about Synthol? That was also a great oversight. But um, but it's there. Okay. But 100 years from now, what will happen? Sure. We'll, we'll have Synthol. Synthol, no doubt. People might still be ingesting uh, vodka through a balloon, which is happening literally right now, too, in London. That's horrible, I think. But whatever. Um, <laughs> but what will people be doing? Like, what 100 years ago... We're, did people think we were going to dig up their names and their recipes and make a whole book about it? That's the strange thing, is the cocktail renaissance is based on the past. And so, in essence, we're, we're, we were mining the past for spirits and ideas and recipes and um, heroes and all of that. And so, a hundred years from now, who knows? Maybe um, they will pick up this book. And they'll be like, Bob, you what a bartender. <laughs> Get it all wrong. <laughs> but you know what I mean? I mean, who knows? They might be yeah. digging back to try to find those good old simple days where people would only use 12 ingredients. Like sure. That. And we'll get a solar flare between now and then, and the internet's going to get wiped out anyway, so we need this. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the echo theory again. Because yeah. you remember what was being served in 10-4. These were like blue drinks. Like oh, yeah. these were like, you know, 70s, <laughs> 80s drinks that like, I actually blamed Next Generation for really wanting me, I, I wanted to drink blue drinks after that. And so I remember buying my first bottle of blue curacao, and I was like, what the hell do I do with this? They always had such <laughs> cheesy glassware too. I they was did, like, wait, yeah. You can get better glassware in the future. Very it's, 80s. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have to say, I, I would probably, you'd probably find me at uh, Quark's Bar in Deep Space Nine. It's oh, a little yeah. more gritty, mm -hmm. like, yeah. uh, you know. Some bad deals going down. Probably. Yeah. I think it'd be a little more exciting than the uh, the Synthah Hall. Well, and, and they got all the bootleg, you know. Oh, coming through the, yeah, through yeah. the wormhole. I was like, yeah. Right. yeah. Absolutely. I didn't I didn't think this interview was going to take this turn. <laughs> <laughs> Neither did we. <laughs> so before we jump into lightning round here, uh, I did have have one question. And this is something I've actually been waiting. What's it? 2019. Six years mm -hmm. to ask you. In 2013 ish, I was wrapping up my MFA in poetry at the University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. And I was I had just taken my WSET two course in wine and started to get into um, some cocktails. I was making homemade bitters, which are now a company that I too. that <laughs> I do full time. Thank you. Yeah. And I started reading about this guy named Derek Brown. Mm -hmm. And the first article that I put, maybe not the first article, but a noteworthy article I pulled up might have been through the DCS. This article is no longer on archive correctly online. But I remember reading a line that said, you know, you, and this was quoting you, maybe incorrectly, but I don't think so. And it said, this cocktail renaissance or revolution or whatever you want to call it. And I was like, how does this guy who seems to be at the forefront, like, you know, open all these bars, he's doing a lot. How does he not have a, have a stake or like, uh, or, or, or care to like, tell us what, what it is. And, and so I, I kind of let it there. I was like, maybe I'll mention it to him in the interview. Maybe I won't. And then I read the book and you did the, or whatever you want to call it, move in the book twice, once in the preface, once in the, in the last chapter. And so I, I wanted to just get your thoughts on this and kind of clear it up so that I have a, a sense of where this is coming from. Well, uh, since you're a, a poetry major, um, you'll appreciate that one of my favorite poets is Baudelaire. Uh -huh. And he has a famous poem called Inivre Fou, uh, which is uh, get drunk. Yeah. In it, he's not really talking about alcohol per se. It's, it goes off on something different. But he says, on wine, poetry, virtue, whatever. And I always loved that structure. <laughs> um, so part of it might be my love of that poetic phrasing. But honestly, I think the, the greater part of it is the fact that it's for the future to determine what this is called. I can't tell you. I would say it's a revolution. We changed everything, right? Like, mm -hmm. But we didn't. We added to the past. So it's a renaissance, but mm -hmm. I don't know. It's very different than the past. So it comes down to a question of what would we call it? And I, I don't know the answer, actually. But I do know that at some point somebody will pick it up. Um, or maybe they'll just say it was just some stupid trend that nobody really cared about. And go back to blue drinks and Guinan will, you know, spin a tail and um, you'll have Chateau Picard on the back bar. And that's that. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> Let's jump into some lightning rounds. What is your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite cocktail of all time, what's something maybe you're most recently obsessed with? Why don't you take that first? 
Derek makes fun of me for this one because he thinks it's an old man's drink, but <laughs> a whiskey sour. Uh, I blame Derek because I started drinking them at his bars. It's Southern efficiency, but it's it's my comfort drink, uh, just like with uh, egg white, rye, and uh, it's a great end of the night drink. You know, slightly sweet, slightly spicy, and um, mm -hmm. it's kind of perfect. So that's mine. Yeah. I uh, Mine is well advertised in here, the dry martini. Um, that's a drink that I think is the most perfect drink. It is, it's, well, I'll tell you something funny about it, actually, um, as a fellow writer. Um, it is the biggest mistake I made in the book, because we get up to the point where I'm talking about dry martini, and I say, and, and I'm trying to make it sound poetic, and I say, it, you know, all the other cocktails at this point flow to the dry martini like a river flows to its source. Uh, of course, a river does not flow to its source, and I had just mixed metaphors there. Fortunately, it's in the second pressing, we've been able to correct that. <laughs> That's good. Uh, <laughs> but if you have the first one, it is in there, and you can look it up, and you can laugh heartily at my mistake. Well, I'll it's give you... It's better than mine. <laughs> mine was calling uh, South Pacific a play rather than a musical, and I got called out in a review for it. Oh, no. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, since we're doing this, I misspelled sarsaparilla on our, oh. our first run of uh, sarsaparilla bitters labels. <laughs> was there an R there? Did you forget the no, R? Was that, I forgot. Well, I didn't forget the R. I, I gave the designer the R, but I didn't proofread what the designer sent back. Yeah. Um, so the designer omitted the R. But um, yeah. So uh, we've all we've all shared. Um, <laughs> we're all human. Everyone needs a good editor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thankfully, we have one. We have one. She got almost. Everything. She was great. <laughs> yeah, technically, I'm supposed to be the editor in that process. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you were a cocktail ingredient, what would you be and why? Oh, Lord. I think I would probably be the lemon peel. Mm -hmm. I know that's like a weird mm. answer, but let me tell you why. First of all, I like lemon in almost every drink that yeah. I have. The outside has this amazing, all these little fissures on it that have all these little chemicals in it yeah. that have amazing aromas and attributes that can change a drink radically. Like uh, try a Sazerac without a lemon peel and it's really not as good. No. Try a dry martini without a lemon peel and it's really not as good. And so you see its power and it's wonderful and it's complicated. Uh, also slightly bitter on the inside. There's so many things that it adds. I'd like to think that I'm a complicated, slightly bitter person. Do you ever, um, <laughs> do you ever mess around with uh, Negronis? You maybe swap out the vermouth and then sub in a lemon peel for the orange twist. Interesting. I've never done it. I, I like done. I like it with if you're using like a light, like a Dolan or even a Carpano. Mm -hmm. But then if you if you're using something like a Punta Mez, you can't really get away with it. You gotta go gotta go <laughs> orange peel. Yeah. Um, I would say I would say the bitters because it's an also an essential part. It's probably dangerous to say this to a bitters guy here, but <laughs> it's one of those essential parts of the cocktail that people forget. But it is um, it's ever changing, and uh, I think it kind of gives it a different identity depending on what you use. And so it's it's kind of the salt and pepper of you know the cocktail world, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a lot of fun, indispensable, I think. Yeah. It's great to have a, a, a nice diverse spice rack when you're yeah. when you're making stuff at home for sure. So this is going to be fun because you did a ton of great research for this book. So cocktail with anyone, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? I think that I would like to go back to um, Shoemakers, the mm. bar where the Ricky was created, <laughs> and talk to George Williamson, um, George Augustus Williamson, who was the inventor of the Ricky, um, known for being a very wonderful human being and a great bartender. He, uh, obviously, he created a, a drink that became DC's signature cocktail. And I just would love to sit at his bar and have him make me a drink. Was that the bar where people got yelled at for cleaning? Yes. yes. Yeah. Shoemaker is also known as Cobweb Hall. <laughs> um, yeah, it was uh, it was uh, a one probably DC's most famous bar. It was at one point entered into the congressional record because uh, Judge Cowan, during an agricultural committee, said, oh, Shoemakers, it has the best whiskey in D.C., and that was it. And now <laughs> Shoemakers was enshrined in Congress. So. Beautiful. I would, so I'd pick uh, 1826, Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, I'm cheating a little bit here because <laughs> I can, it's a twofer. Uh, so I'd go up to Monticello and uh, I'd sit down with, with Thomas Jefferson, a big uh, Jefferson fan. Um, and while... Uh, it would not be a cocktail, though. Uh, he was not a big fan of spirits, although we know him as sort of the first American connoisseur of fine wines. So I think, um, you know, 
bottle of Bordeaux from the cellar, pre phylloxera You know, he's a complicated guy, complex legacy. I a lot I need to ask him. And so maybe the bottle. Like, um, <laughs> but uh, that would be um, that would be the first stop. And then down the mountain to uh, University of Virginia to uh, have a drink with one of the early students, which would be Edgar Allan Poe, uh, who uh-huh. was living in Charlottesville, Virginia, the exact same time John Jefferson was still alive. And we would have some peaches and honey in his dorm room. Um, and I think it would be kind of fun to meet the young, you know, energetic, optimistic Poe before he takes sort of that macabre turn. But to see the uh, <laughs> to see where it, from whence it came. But. Yeah. Well, in Edgar Allan Poe, we've got the peach brandy. Yeah. And, and that Edgar Allan Poe was actually a big influence on those French surrealists. Absolutely. Baudelaire. Baudelaire. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So it's all coming full circle. More <laughs> echoes. Yes. So... Guys, thanks so much for sitting down with me. Uh, I want to make sure that we get you out of here so that your your staff has time to get ready for service here uh, at the beautiful Columbia Room Bar. For anybody who has not gotten to visit the bar, uh, I would just admonish you for that and say make it right at once. Incredible cocktails and we've got a, a new pro- a new program that's rolling out called So Bad It's Good. Yep. It seems like it might be at least partially inspired by some of the, the later chapters in this book. <laughs> yeah, that and uh, the new bar manager slash head bartender, Paul, is just was trying to mock me a little bit, I guess. So he did it. He's like, I can make a good Long Island iced tea. <laughs> so and one little book secret, actually. So if you do come to the Columbia Room, which everybody should, and you come to the back room here, see the mural, there's a, a, a mosaic, a beautiful mosaic on the wall here. And you see their names you know, written down below of important people throughout cocktail history. And so every single one of those names found its way into the book somewhere. We, uh, seeded them into chapters uh, throughout. So it's, it's a little bit of a challenge. Come have a drink, see the mosaic, read the book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You really shoehorned Aristotle in there. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it became a game. It was a creative game. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, gentlemen, can you just tell our readers where to find you uh, digitally, where they can purchase the book, and anything else you want to plug? Yeah, I would say, you know, go purchase it at whatever your usual bookstore is. Obviously, it's on all the big digital ones online, but you can get it anywhere um, online. Um, and local bookstores are great to support. Uh, you can find me at, at Ideas Improve on Twitter and Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we have a website too, uh, spiritsugarwaterbitters.com, uh, where you can find uh, upcoming events, things like that. And I'm at Historic DC, Twitter and Instagram. Beautiful. Derek and Bob, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Well, thanks so much for inviting us. A lot of fun. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners, and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember, folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed. On-location photo and lighting support by Charlie Birkinshaw of Element Shrub. 
Spirited insights by Bob Ewell and Derek Brown, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2019.